Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on First and Second Peter. And we're getting close to the end of that series. This is lesson number 12 for June 17 of 2017, entitled, The Day of the Lord. Now, if you remember what it says in Second Peter 3, you have a little, uh, pretty good idea what we're going to be talking about in this lesson. But as always, we want to pray and ask the Lord to guide us because we've got some challenging material to talk about. Our Father, we now come opening our hearts and our minds to your influence, the work of the Holy Spirit, as we talk about this very challenging uh, chapter in the book of Second Peter. May we understand what is here and may we apply it to our lives in the way you want us to apply it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Skeptics don't want to believe that anybody can predict the future, not even God. But in this lesson, we're going to find that Peter predicts some things that sound an awful lot like the world we're living in today. Well, and there was, and, and stepping back a hundred years or so, virtually everyone believed in God and in a final judgment. And those who didn't want to think about a final judgment are now suggesting that God does not even exist. See, if you, if you get, if you eliminate God from your thinking, well, then there's no chance that he's going to, at least you don't think there's, you pretend that there's no chance that God's going to come back and bring on a final judgment. But fear is never, and, and people, some people say, well, but you need to know that Jesus is coming back and you better straighten up your life and so forth. But we learn from the Old Testament especially that fear is never the best motivator. And what do we mean when we say that? It's a good short-term motivator, but it doesn't work for long. It works for a little while. And then people go back to their own thinking, their old thinking. After the flood, how long was it before people were doing just as wicked things? After Babylonian captivity, even the Jews went back to doing the same sins they, that made them go into Babylonian captivity. Here's an interesting thought from Ellen White. It's found in Review on Herald, August 2, 1881, entitled, and, and this is what it says, The shortness of time is urged as an incentive for us to seek righteousness and to make Christ our friend. This is not the great motive. It savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God be held before us to compel us through fear to right action? This ought not to be. Jesus is attractive. He is full of love, mercy, and compassion. He proposes to be our friend, to walk with us through all the rough pathways of life. And that's in Review and Herald. August 2 of 1881, and for those who remember a little bit about the history of Ellen White, that was published four days before her husband James died in August 6 of 1881. And there's a, isn't there a similar passage in Grace Controversy? Yeah, there's some similar thing, yeah. And that's a, big, that's a great, great quotation. Yeah. Is that in, kind of in reaction to what Jonathan Edwards did, the sinner dangling from a uh, yeah. A thread over the fire of hell or something like that? It was in the hands of an angry God. When yeah. I saw that picture, you know, what, what a ghoulish yeah. story. But it's, uh, eventually people uh, get numb to it. So you, you, know, you can't scare. You, well, it's numbed. <laughs> it, it, numbed. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you well, can't scare people into heaven. Doesn't it scare you to think that God is going to melt the elements someday? Well, just right here it says that things carry on just as they have been, for instance, creation. Yeah. So you know. That's what the skeptics say. Yeah. Well, what else do they have to go by? It's like like the serpent. Yeah. It says, "Oh, you're not going to die." The serpent, Satan, had never seen death until yeah. till uh, uh, he, Cain killed Abel. There was no death in the yeah. universe mm -hmm. prior to that, except for animals. But if 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 God is going to melt the world someday wouldn't be a good idea to be prepared <laughs> well <laughs> unless you thought it was going to be so far off that uh, that it wouldn't affect you 
But what about that? Well, look at Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I have tried to arouse pure thoughts in your minds by reminding you of these things. I want you to remember the words that were spoken long ago by the holy prophets and the command from the Lord and Savior which was given you by your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in these last days some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock and will ask, He promised to come, didn't he? Where is he? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it, once, as it was since the creation of the world. Is that true? The theory of uniformity. They believe it. It's interesting to notice if you, if you look at the Bible and you look at the skeptics' comments, there are three parts of the Bible they especially want to attack. You know what those three parts are? Creation. Well, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, okay, creation and the flood, okay? Prophecy, like Daniel. And where Revelation. else? Revelation. Revelation, Daniel and Revelation. The, these are the three sections of Scripture that they want to do away with. And anything that references them. Yeah. yeah. Like Second Peter. Who was, who was Peter talking about when he talked about uh, the apostles of the Lord and the Savior? It's not a difficult question. The, the disciples, his, exactly. his own yeah. associates, yeah. himself, and those who Christ had sent, had and himself, right? And himself, he says, "We were there. We taught you these things. How, how you can't? Please don't give them up. I mean, you have the Old Testament. You have the stuff we taught you. What's the problem? Well, we need to be aware that God knows everything." This is a hard thing for us to accept. We, we, we can't, a lot of people really don't even want to try to wrap their mind around that. Yeah, we, we hear a lot about the NSA these days oh and boy. lots of stuff, you know, the government knows everything. Well, God knows everything. And a he not more. only knows what we say and what we write, he knows our motives. Mm -hmm. Not only all the stuff in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. What are we going to do about that? That's the way I was raised. Yeah. To be afraid of that. Well, and now that's another story. <laughs> why should you be afraid of that? <laughs> well, <laughs> it kept me from doing a lot of things that I might have gone ahead and done thinking that, <laughs> ooh, God knows what I'm doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that fear factor. You mean you might have beat up on your sister more? Um, probably. Be <laughs> <laughs> more and, no. <laughs> well, we believe that, that Christian teachings are based solidly on the Word of God, the teachings of Scripture. We must never allow public opinion, you know, and, and, he, and this is one of the challenges. I mean, we hear all these arguments, you know, and, and, and some of them sound pretty logical, at least initially, but we must never allow those kinds of things to dissuade us from believing what God has written in the Old and the New Testament. Well, how often do we allow reason, our own reason, our own judgment, or the so-called scientific facts to convince us that God's Word is maybe not, not the whole story? You know, maybe part of it isn't completely true. That ever happen? We, we need to be reasonable about things. Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't believe the Bible. Okay. I mean, we talk about we have to read the Bible and put it together in a reasonable way, don't we? So we have to use logic and reason, but uh, that and can that, become rationalization, though. Yeah. Well, uh, but we do have to use our brains. Our yes, exactly. Brains. The only the only instrument God can can communicate with us through is our brain. So if we're not using that properly, what can He do? Let you go. Yeah. How many times have you seen people wander off into who knows what because they're just married to some pet theory that doesn't really match Scripture? 
Well, uh, since we cannot see into the future as God can, and all we have to look at is the past, it's easy for skeptics to bring up the argument that nothing has changed and nothing will change. Their claim that all things will continue as they always have is known as uniformitarianism. How many syllables are in there in that word? Well, they do not believe in special creation as outlined in Genesis, nor in the flood in the days of Noah. Instead, they teach that all things can be explained as happening slowly over vast periods of time. I am listening to a very interesting series right now about uh, by a geologist, a, someone who's famous in the National Geographic group, who's and he, he shows lots of beautiful stuff, and it's he goes around and he explains things in all of the nation, national parks in the United States. But of course, all of it's based on well, this is you know, see these rocks are thirty billion years old, and these trees and this these fossils are so forth, and it's just, I mean, he can he can just roll that billions of years off his tongue like, yeah, sure, no problem. You think they're just lying? No. Do I they think believe it? Well, I was asking him. I wasn't asking him. <laughs> I'm sorry. I gave my opinion. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, he clearly believes it. Well, do you think that he believed it out of thin air? I think he believed it out of a collection of scientific evidence that he interprets that way. The author. The evidence is there, but the question is the interpretation. Yeah, uh, I forget his first name, Lyle. He was uh, uh, an attorney in, in England back in the early 1800s, and he wrote the book on geology. So he's sort of the father of modern geology, but he wrote to a friend that he wrote the book in order to uh, do away with Moses. <laughs> so you, you could see the, the intent was there. And the idea was that if you study sediment, uh, sedimentation and you assume that all of these layers were, were laid down slow and gradual, uh, then you could get millions and millions of years. Mm -hmm. But of course to have fossils in there preserved, they had to be laid down quick. So I, I don't know how they worked that out back yeah. then, but uh, it wasn't until about 1960 that they accepted any kind of catastrophic uh, explanation for uh, geology, but it was always local kinds of stuff. And now they, uh, they're they talking about lumpy evolution. Something happens really fast, and then for a long period of time, nothing happens. No, 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 will happen. <laughs> <laughs> Punctuated equilibrium or something. Punctuated, okay, there you go. Yeah. Well, Peter has a couple of interesting comments. Uh, we already talked about Second Peter 2 last time, but look at this passage especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts and despise God's authority. These false teachers are bold and arrogant and show no respect for the glorious beings above. Instead, they insult them. So they're following what? Their lusts. Their filthy bodily lusts. But then if you come over to chapter 3 and you read verse 3, it says, First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people will appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask and so forth. What do the lusts have to do with these things? Well, those are the foundation things that pull us astray. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and boastful pride of life. Uh, we don't have time to lay it all out, but you can look at Adam and Eve, and the fall of Eve, the temptations that Christ had, uh, Hebrews 11, Moses, uh, I overcame on those areas, and it even gets into uh, the beasts and Daniel if we take it that far. So there's, it's sort of the baseline. Well, and basically what we're talking about is people who are consumed by their own passions and their own evil desires, they don't want to be judged by God. They don't want to be concerned with what's in Scripture. They want to set all that stuff aside. So... What do they do? They think of ways to ex try to explain it away. This isn't a coincidence. 
So the idea that things have not changed, or at least they're changing very slowly, and therefore they will not and will not change, is a very dangerous heresy. Because we cannot see into the future, and thus be able to point to facts that will occur in the future, it is easy for unbelievers to challenge their ideas which are based only on Scripture. But we must remember that if Jesus is not planning to come back again, there was no reason for him to come the first time. It has been, may I remind you, almost 173 years since the Great Disappointment in 1844. And it has been 1986 years since Jesus died in 8031. Why has there been such a long delay? Is Dead silent. Work? Is there anybody working on to, trying to find an answer? <laughs> well, shouldn't we be? I think we should be. Well, Peter says that it's, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So there's yeah. some element of, of that in there, mm -hmm. that there's a point in which no one else could be saved. In, incredible as it may seem, Enoch was wondering about this back before the flood. Way, way back. You know, amazing. And Ellen White says about him, his thoughts says he wondered if the righteous and the wicked would, quote, would go to the dust together and that this would be their end. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 85, paragraph 6. And as Adventists, we are pronouncing even by our name that we believe in a soon coming. Are we disappointed that God has delayed so long? Well, you know the argument. Peter spelled it out way in advance. But do not forget one thing, my dear friends. There is no difference in the Lord's sight between one day and a thousand years. To him the two are the same. The Lord is not slow to, slow to do what he has promised, as some think. Instead, he is patient with you because he does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants all to turn away from their sins. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and earth with everything in it will vanish. Is that a warning? Is a warning or a threat or a promise? No, what about that? If he's waiting for us to do our part, mm -hmm. I don't see it getting better, but only worse. Well, way back in the Old Testament, in Psalms 90, verse 4, the psalmist said, One thousand years to you are like a day. They are like yesterday already gone, like a short hour in the night. So does that mean, well, God doesn't really care how long it takes? He's not dumb. He knows the difference between one day and a thousand years. It's just that he can supersede that in some aspects. He can, he can see back there and his memory is clear and there's no the problem. Future. And he can see in the future. He can see both directions. I, I've been thinking about this and I'm at a point in my life right now where I'm trying to get back into exercise. Okay. And you can come up with every excuse in the really? world to do it. And three not years to ago, not to do it. or not to do it. At least I can. Yeah, <laughs> it's very easy to do that. And three years ago, I was in the best shape I was in. Swore I'd never go back. To me, this is very similar. I can come up with all the excuses and not prepare mm -hmm. myself for something that is eventually going to happen, whether it happens tomorrow or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, is up to me. Now, I can't say when God is going to come, that's up to Him, but my own preparedness for that is up to me. Yeah. And how do you find that inner strength without having God to help you. Yeah. Well, Peter talks about the destruction of the old world by a flood. What does that have to do with events in the final days of this earth's history? That's way back there thousands of years ago. Is that relevant anymore? 
that was how the wicked were destroyed yeah. at the time of the flood when things reached a certain point. So then he goes. Do you on think to that show. might could have some relevance to us today? Getting worse. <laughs> well, Jesus referenced the flood mm -hmm. as far as the next, as far as the end of the world comes. Yeah. So he's just picking that up, I think. Okay. Well, in in the context of our very brief lives, <coughs> excuse me a second. Um, a delay seems like a big deal. But if our if our if we lived a thousand years like Adam did, almost, uh, a little delay wouldn't seem so, like such a big deal. And, and imagine if we were in, had the perspective that. Um, God has. So as God waits and we grow weary, who looks good? Is it God or us? Not us. Yeah. <laughs> Not us? <laughs> well, it's God if indeed he's trying to convince every last person that will be convinced to join his side. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think he's doing. And how does he intend to do that? Through evidence. And how are they going to find out about the evidence? I read a lot of stories. Who's, 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 who, our who, lives. Yeah, who's who's lives going to tell us? Good. Who's going to tell them? We're the ones that God chooses to tell them. All Jesus' ministry was telling stories. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we, we mustn't take the other extreme either, that even though we believe Jesus is going to come back, and it suggests, well, it's not for a long time yet. Matthew, Paul, John all talk about the suddenness and finality of the second coming. Well, what do you think Peter w had in mind when he talked about the elements melting with fervent heat? Now, there were four elements in his day. Do you remember what they were? Fire. Earth, water, fire, fi fire and, and air, wasn't it? Yeah, wind. Well, wind or air. air yeah. I think that weren't, weren't those the four elements? But anyway, what do you think he had in mind when he said the elements are going to melt with fervent heat? He's going to nuke us. <laughs> He's going to nuke us? <laughs> Not going to wait for North Korea to do it? That doesn't have to kill anybody. Human nature or things, sin, evil left to run its own course will ultimately self-destruct and take a lot of others with them. Well, if we believe that Jesus is coming back pretty soon, how, how, how should that impact our lives? Well, you read that quotation earlier. Yeah. Uh, that if it, you can't scare people into heaven. Yeah. You, uh, remember Gene Sheldon wrote a book, Chasing Heaven to Avoid Hell. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't work it may, with a handful of people, but in the grand scheme of things, in the long term, it doesn't. Mm. If, you're, if you're not, don't have an affinity for truth and love, you're spinning your wheels. Well, here's what Peter said, Second Peter 3, verse, verses 11 and 12. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon, the day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. <coughs> Does that mean the earth is going to be so hot that we're going to melt Venus? Now, w w w how do we understand those things? Maybe it's the satellites we've put up there. Maybe it's, and I see. He's just saying that all that was is going to pass on. Mm -hmm. and then the new is going to come in. Yeah. Basically. Does it mean that God is going to destroy everything that has any trace of sin connected to it? What, how much would you have to destroy to, to destroy sin and, and evil and sickness and death? Now, Basic. is that going to happen before the judgment? time? Well, when you, you, when you answer my question first. I mean, <laughs> well, you could, the, you're, the you're, entire, the you're evil. You're saying all the sin is going to be destroyed 
when he comes. Yeah. So if you're saying that, that means all the sinners will be destroyed also. Okay. So, but anyway, if you think about it, the all the evil in the universe is 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 in a, a small little envelope around our Earth. Right. It's a bit of stuff that we've shot off to other planets. Well, and and, and, and I suppose. I suppose we should include the evil angels. We don't know how much yeah, where are they? ability they have to move around. They've been rejected by other, mm -hmm. other life forms. So all the stuff that we've touched, we've contaminated, and he has yeah, to burn absolutely. it all? You think that's true? Well, you go to the city dump and get an idea and multiply that by tens of thousands worldwide, plus all the, all the poisons and bug killers and... Well, weed we, killers, uh, it's got to be cleaned up. The only way to do it is to but burn it. But that's all made out of stuff that the Lord had created. Yeah, but when he created it, it was all good. And, and we now have we have the knowledge of good and evil. So there's things that are at play in our present world that were not the same before the fall. But okay. if he destroys it all, then what's the use to having that knowledge now? Since well, evil's not around anymore. He's got to rebuild it. He's going to well, have to re remake it, yeah. Reforms it. Well, are, how much are we being affected by the attitudes of the world around us? Are we becoming more and more like the world? Are we becoming more and more like Jesus Christ? Well, let's look at some ways that people have approached this issue. We all know people who've said, let's see, they've studied down and they've twisted certain scriptures around. Hey, guess what? The Lord's coming next year and I have proof of it. And they have their charts and their everything like that. And after a while, we just go, home, oh, hum, you know. That's the best way to raise money. <laughs> well, it works. That works pretty well, too. Well, I think most of the time when that happens, they're... They're trying to raise money. Is, it a, is that a greater danger to be setting dates? Or is it a greater danger to be like most other Adventists who say, well, nothing very serious is happening. Let's go on living our lives the way we are. are you, you're asking, is it worse to misinterpret Scripture or to ignore Scripture? <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. Two sides of the... Two ditches on the side of yeah. the road. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. They're both bad. Yeah. It's very easy to be caught up, get caught up in our daily activities and all the things that we think are very important right now and the things that we have to do. And, you know, you don't have an option here. You just have to do it because of your job or whatever. Um, it's easy to push back the ideas about the second coming. Well, does this reflect the fact that we spend so much time concerning ourselves with our current responsibilities and goals instead of time with the Bible? How much time do we spend studying the Bible and sharing the gospel with others? Do we spend more time watching the news, watching the latest movies, following the latest fashions, listening to popular music? And if you're somewhere between 15 and 25 years of age, where do you fit? Well, Ken, when you got to have some people that want to listen to you. Okay. So, you have nobody that wants to listen. Well, then where are you? How do you answer that question? Well, uh, what did Jesus do? I would admit, let's let's follow his example. Well, he went out and started healing people, but I. Yeah. I mean, you, you're the closest they can do that since you're a doctor, but I sure can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, I could bring a lot of people in to start listening to me if I started healing people. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. Well, Peter ends off, or, or almost ends off his third chapter by with these verses, Second Peter three fourteen to 18. And so, my friends, as you wait for that day, so he says... It's, it's, a, it's a done deal, no question about it, it's coming. So as you wait for that day, do your best to be pure and faultless in God's sight and to be at peace with Him. Look on our Lord's patience, that's what we're talking about, as the opportunity He is giving you to be saved. 
just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you using the wisdom that God gave him. <coughs> this is what he says in all his letters when he writes on the subject. There are some difficult things in his letters which ignorant and unstable people explain falsely as they do with other passages of the scriptures. So they bring on their own destruction. But you, my friends, already know this. Be on your guard then so that you will not be led away by the errors of lawless people and fall from your safe position. But continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory now and forever. Amen. That's the end of Second Peter. So what's he trying to say? He said, I've given compelling reasons as far as he was concerned why we need to take this serious. And so therefore, what you need to do, you need to be getting yourselves ready. But he has some interesting things to say about Paul. And now I'm going to ask you a question. Where do you think Peter was when he wrote this letter? Probably in the same jail as Paul. Very likely in the Mamertine prison there in, in Rome, and very possibly Peter and Paul were there in prison about the same time. He may have been writing about Paul while Paul's sitting the other side of the room. They have a shortage of paper. I don't know. Since you had two writers in one place. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So why do you think he said what he did about Paul? I mean, what's he suggesting there? Paul is inspired like the Old Testament prophets. Yeah. yeah. Well, earlier, we looked at last week, it said you have the Old, you have the Old Testament to, to follow and you have the apostles of Jesus Christ. Who's he talking about there? Disciples. He and his buddies, right? And Paul. Because yeah. he was an apostle, and there were mm -hmm. other apostles yeah. as well. It could almost be talking about the New Testament, too. Yeah. Only probably at that time, some of it wasn't quite put together yet, so you listened to them. Now, now Paul said in earlier one of his earlier writings that Peter was sent, was sent to the Jews, and he was sent to the who? Paul was, was the apostle to the Gentiles, right? Mm -hmm. Peter and Paul had some uh, run-ins once or twice. Do we know about those? Yep. Look at Galatians 2, verses 6 to 14. But those, and this is Paul writing now about, we can see he's writing about Peter. But those who seem to be the leaders, I say this because it makes no difference to me what they were, God does not judge by outward appearances. Those leaders, I say, made no new suggestions to me. On the contrary, they saw that God had given me the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as he'd given Peter the task of preaching the gospel to the Jews. Now, was Peter one of the leaders that he says, I don't care what those people believe. For by God's power, I was made an apostle to the Gentiles, just as Peter was made an apostle to the Jews. James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be the leaders, isn't that what he's talking about? Recognized that God had given me this special task, so they shook hands with Barnabas and me as a sign that we were all partners. We agreed that Barnabas and I would, be, would work among the Gentiles and they among the Jews. All they asked was that we should remember the needy in their group, which is the very thing I have been eager to do. Well, then he goes on, but when Peter came to Antioch, and where is Antioch located? Syria. Syria. It's in Turkey right now. It's, the people of Antioch literally voted not to be a part of Syria, to be a part of Turkey a number of years ago. So there's a little dip, in, a little appendix on, on a Turkey, and so it's now in Turkey. But it used to be a part of Syria. Now we had a chance to visit there a few years ago. Just about the time ISIS was... We, the, the, the last night we were there, we, we woke up in the morning and the ISIS flag was flying at the top of the mountain above us. But when Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him in public because he was clearly wrong. Before some men who had been sent by James, now who were the leaders back in Jerusalem that he talked about? 
James, Peter, James and, James and John, right? So now, here's Peter. So who are the leaders left back in Jerusalem? Must be James and John. So here he's talking about James. But this is probably the, the James, the brother of Jesus, not the James, the brother of John. Before some people who've been sent by, in fact, it has to be because James, the brother of John, was already dead. Before some men who had been sent by James arrived there, Peter had been eating with the Gentile brothers and sisters. But after these men arrived, um, sorry, they, he drew back and would not eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who were in favor of circumcising them. The other Jewish brothers and sisters also started acting like cowards along with Peter. And even Barnabas was swept away by their cowardly action. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter, in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you have been living like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How then can you try to force Gentiles to live like Jews? Boy, that's a... Uh, have you ever stood up and made a, given a message like that in your church? Is the word force in there? <laughs> doesn't sound like the way God would say it or Jesus would say it and yet Peter as he's writing in this letter of his he calls him our beloved brother Paul who opposed me vigorously a few years ago yeah well 20 20 plus years ago so well he, he repented Yes. He saw the error of his way. Yeah. Well, Paul had also talked about what we need to do while we're waiting for Jesus to come. Look at two or three places. Romans 2, verse 4. Or perhaps you despise his great kindness, tolerance, and patience. Surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent. So what do we need to do? We need to repent of all those evil ways. Romans 12, verse 18, do everything possible in, on your part to live in peace with everybody. So what's another thing we need to do? Live in peace, especially with our fellow Christians, right? Philippians 2, verse 12, so then, dear brothers, as you always obeyed me, this is Paul writing, when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey me now while I'm away from you. Keep on working with fear and trembling, to complete your salvation because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own to obey his own purpose okay well do you think most of the Christians in Peter's and Paul's day were already held Peter's held Paul's uh, held Paul's writings in high regard you can step out in faith here and Exercise your It belief. seems that they did. I think when the letters of Paul came around, they were so compelling that I think pretty quickly they were they were accepted. Although Paul had his, his detractors, he seemed oh, yeah. to have some conflict with you know, some of his letters were to try to combat somewhat the uh, the false prophets if we go back to the last week's lesson. Peter um, talks about people who like to twist and misconstrue Paul's writings. Do we know anybody like that? Is there anybody in the world today who likes to twist and misconstrue Paul's writings? How about a lot of preachers? Yeah. Well, and the more you write, and the more you see, you lay yourself open to something that can be misunderstood, right? Mm -hmm. But we would say that Paul's support for the truths of the gospel, the truths of the Bible was very firm, and there was no license for sin in his writings. So, now, coming down to our day, which is a greater problem in your church out there? Is it twisting the scriptures or ignoring the scriptures? Yes. <laughs> Depends on the circumstance. They both come both. into play. Yeah. Yeah. What could we do as individual church members to set a fire on the group and, and, and just really inspire people to get back to 
the truth and the stu Bible study and make things happen again? Maybe showing by example, having Bible studies. There's a good option. Yeah. Remember, it, it's hard not to remember. You know how much we talk about it. Matthew 24, 41, 45 to 51. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? It is, it, is it, it is the one who is, that his master has placed in charge of the other servants to give them their food at the proper time. How happy that servant is if his master finds him doing this when he comes home. Indeed, I tell you, the master will put that servant in charge of all his property. Can you think of somebody, let's say in the Old Testament, who was elevated to a very high level because he was so faithful? Daniel. Joseph. Okay. And Joseph, Joseph too, yeah. two of them. But if he's a bad servant, he will tell himself that his master will not come back um, for a long time and he will begin to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. Then that servant's master will come back one day when the servant does not expect him and at a time he does not know. The master will cut him in pieces and make him share the fate of the hypocrites. There he will cry and grind his teeth. Okay. Well, in Ellen White's writings, Desire of Ages 634, paragraph 2, she says this, Because we know not the exact time of his coming, we are commanded to watch. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Luke 12, 37. Those who watch for the Lord's coming are not waiting in idle expectancy. The expectation of Christ's coming is to make men fear the Lord and fear his judgments upon transgression. It is to awaken them to the great sin of rejecting his offers of mercy. Those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by obedience to the truth. Ellen White had some very interesting things to say about the delay also. Let me look at a few of those. The long night of mercy, I want you to notice this, the long night of mercy, uh, I'm sorry, the long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason for so long delay. And when did she write that? 1868. How long was that after the Great Disappointment? 24 years. And Only so five years after the church, the Adventist church was organized, yes? Almost 150 years ago. Actually, yeah. over 150 years ago. Almost 150. Okay. It seems like an endless proposition there mm -hmm. because you're 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 waiting for all these people to straighten up so he can come then they end up dying then more people get born into the world then you have to wait for them so when does it stop well if you look at it like that never well then what's the purpose of this well let's read some more words the angels of God and their messages to men represent time is very short. Thus it has always been presented to me. It is true that, this is Ellen White of course, it is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of this message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and threatenings of God are alike conditional. God had committed to his people a work to be accomplished on earth. The third angel's message was to be given. The messages, I mean, I'm sorry, the minds of believers were to be directed to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ had entered to make atonement for his people. The Sabbath reform was to be carried forward. The breach in the law of God must be made up. The message must be proclaimed with a loud voice that all the inhabitants of earth might receive the warning. The people of God must purify their souls through obedience to the truth and be prepared to stand without fault before him at his coming. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel and in the, pro power, I'm sorry, in the power of the Holy Spirit proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God the Lord would have wrought mightily with uh, their efforts. 
with their efforts, the work would have been completed and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to their reward. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed, by the way, when was this written? 1883. 1883. In the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen the few who, following in the province of God, providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding warnings, warning to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth, and in turn, the labors of its advocates was necessary, necessarily sent, spent in answering these opponents and defending the truth. Thus the work was hindered, and the world was left in darkness. Does that sound familiar? People who are talking, wondering why we're delayed. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. Were was, they not united in 19, 1844? Well, they weren't united by 1845. That's the problem. They were pretty united in 1844. So why didn't he come? Well, obviously the, the, the unity wasn't permanent. It wasn't genuine unity. No. It was unity from fear. Yeah. Well, had the whole Adventist body, I'm reading on, had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. When did he want to come? Back in the 1840s. God did when not design. The, when was the Sabbath brought in? 18, like 48, 49. That's what she's ref referencing there, is the uniting yeah. of the commandments of God would be the Sabbath, and some rejected it. Mm -hmm. So it would at least be that late. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan, talking about the children of Israel, and establish them there, a holy, healthy, and happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and the, he could not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. For a lot more than 40 years. In neither case were the promise of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that they have kept us, and that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Written in 1883. Yeah, Volume four. Well, manuscript well, we four. Didn't have all the truth at the time they expected Christ to come. Yeah. So what is it going to take now that we have the truth? written very plainly for us. Do we have all the truth? Do we? Mm -hmm. We have Who as much we? as, I think we have as much as we need. I don't think, I think God, God says so. He said God uh, sends some truth and then he waits to see if we accept it whether he, and whether it's time to send some more. If Ellen White has been dead for more than 100 years, is there a reason? why we don't have another prophet? Well, obviously you're pointing to us that we didn't do Could that. I do that? <laughs> well, obviously <laughs> you are, but the fact is he didn't come. No. He didn't come. No, he did So whether, <coughs> whether it's our fault or not, he didn't come. He wasn't surprised. He knew he wasn't gonna come. But in light of all the information in this lesson, which is more important in your daily experience? Is it preparing for the second coming and eternal life with the Lord or dealing with the challenges of living day by day? What teachings, beliefs, and practices do we as Seventh-day Adventists hold that are not consistent with the, our culture, our reasoning capacity, 
our tradition but are solely dependent upon our understanding of the Word of God? Would that be true of our keeping the seventh day Sabbath? Our understanding and belief of what is taught in Genesis 1 to 11? Our understanding of the nature of man? Our beliefs regarding the state of the dead? How, what do we know about the future of us after we die? Where does that come from? Prophecy. Only from Scripture. Only from Scripture. So why do we need to know that here? Well, we're talking about the future, and so this is part of the future. So why, why do we need to know that? Why well, doesn't he just come and then we, <laughs> we get taught it? Well, I mean, that would be fine, but um, for whatever reason, he's decided to delay. Well, as well, mentioned... Well, you said what the reason was. Yeah. Uh, it's our fault. Well, let, let me read it to you. As mentioned earlier, sinful passions and tendencies tend to lead to false teachings and beliefs. That's what Peter said. Why is that? It is very easy for those who are caught up in their favorite sins and worldly pleasures of our day to think of reasons to ignore or twist unpopular teachings from the Bible. Albert Einstein shook the world by suggesting that based on his mathematical calculations and his understanding of science, time is not always constant. He suggested that the speed of one's movement and one's position might impact how slow or how fast time moves. While very few of us understand all he was talking about, does it raise questions about God's understanding of time? God does know, uh, does God know more than we do? Well, some have uh, mocked the, regard, the investigative judgment because of the time that has lapsed. And, yeah. uh, the assumption being that uh, God is in the heavenly quarter experiencing time at the same rate that we are, but there's no, that, that's speculation because we don't even know where heaven is exactly and how they, they experience time. Uh, it could be yeah. a thousand years or it could be a day, you know, yeah. uh, compared to... I, I hope there's no twisting of thought on that. <laughs> to make it... I, I remember sense. many years ago reading a little blip. Somebody did some research right after World War II. Remember that one of our things that we used to help, help us win the Second World War was radar. We developed radar. And right after World War II, as ever, the general population was learning about radar, they went around to high schools and asked the students, does God understand radar? And most of the students didn't think he did. Isn't that incredible? No matter what we may believe about time or about the delay in the second coming, we must never question its reality. How should we deal with the scoffers who doubt the reality of Christ's second coming and at the same time avoid basically by our practices doing what they are doing? Why does God view that time so differently from the way we view time? Well, we talked a little bit about that. It is really possible, is it really possible for us to hasten the second coming of Jesus Christ, as it says in 2 Peter 3.12? If God already knows when the second coming will happen, how can we work to hasten it? If we need to finish spreading the gospel before Jesus can come again, and I'll read you the verse, Matthew 24.14, and this gospel the kingdom about the kingdom will be preached to all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Does that mean it can't come because we haven't done our job? Well, you're assuming that we haven't preached to the whole king, the whole world yet. Shall right? I show you huge sections of the world who have never heard about Jesus? Hmm. If he would come, they would find out. <laughs> That's a little late. No, I don't think so. <laughs> well, and I read now, this is from Mel and White. Knowledge is knowledge. <laughs> if those who claim to have a living experience in the things of God had done their appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would have been warned ere this, and the Lord Jesus would have come in power and great glory. <coughs> Excuse me. What, about 100 years ago or more? For God has appointed a day in which he will come, he will judge the world. He tells us when that day shall be, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for when it's unto all nations, and then shall the end come. 
1896, October 6, 1896. Is there anybody in this room that is sad that Jesus didn't come back then? No. Scripture teaches and Bible-believing Christians assert that God created all things in the beginning. We believe that a flood in the days of Noah basically destroyed everything. And we believe on the basis of that that it's possible for him to come again and destroy everything by fire. Paul says in Romans 1, 18 to 21, that there is all the evidence you need from the world around us, from nature, for believing that God is the creator and the, and the, and the, uh, the sustainer of our world. But if you, like the skeptics, a priori throughout any action involving God in creation, the flood, or any future cataclysmic events, what happens? You have to deny the second coming. Um, what do we do with those ancient biblical records? Well, obviously the skeptics want to throw them out. So in our study for this week, Peter discusses delay. We have been told repeatedly that there would be delay. Look at Matthew 24 and 25. What, did the, what happened with the, the sleeping virgins, etc.? You know, other places. What time was Peter talking about in these passages? Notice that there is no separation in Peter's mind between events that we now recognize as being a part of the second coming and the final dealing with sin that will take place at the third coming. <laughs> Apparently, the Old Testament writers were not aware that there would be more than one coming. They thought, based on their interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies, that when the Messiah arrived, he would eliminate all their enemies, usher in an eternal kingdom, and be the ruler of the world. In a similar way, the New Testament writers apparently thought that there would, would only be a second coming. It was not until very late in the life of the last remaining apostle, John, that God revealed to him that there would be a millennium and a third coming. We do not know exactly why God chose not to reveal these t details earlier. So, in summary, what should we be doing to get ready? If all these things are going to happen, there's only one safe way out of here, and that's up. We need to be serious about getting ourselves ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ, but it's because it's going to happen soon. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these records which challenge us to think, challenge us to prepare ourselves for what is coming. May that be our, our, our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.